Coming up next is the story of one of the greatest rock songs of the 1980s, and it all started with a museum exhibit. This band was on tour here in America, and they took in a museum, and this song was basically written on this field trip. And then the lead singer convinced a famous producer to put off retirement to work on this track, but it took months to record because the song wasn't sounding right, the lyrics weren't finished, they weren't sure what they had. But the band had to deliver a record by a certain deadline, so in order to hit that, they worked 20 hours a day for two weeks straight to finish this masterpiece. He was writing as he was going. Then they filmed three different music videos for it and they hated them all. Was this song ever gonna get released? Find out how it did and why the iconic singer changed the famous lyrics decades later, and that's what he sings now. Hey music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember uh, the B-sides to every 45 or cassette single, CD single that you own, depending on when you grew up, you're gonna love this channel. The stories of the song straight from the artist. Make sure to take a moment right now and subscribe below. Uh, click the bell so that you always know when our latest interviews and videos drop. And we also have a Patreon. You're gonna wanna check that out. Uh, we have exclusive content on there. You can even become an honorary producer to help us curate this music history. Very important, that's what we try to do is keep the music alive. You know, after collaborating on three albums together, the members of U2 and producer Steve Lillywhite felt it was time to part ways. Not wanting to repeat the same formula for their upcoming fourth studio album, the band decided that they needed someone to steer them into a new, a more experimental direction. That someone turned out to be ambient music pioneer, Brian Eno. Of course, Brian Eno had previously produced albums for David Bowie and Talking Heads. In Bono's words, it was time for you 2 to progress. We'd always made a statement that we were a progressive group we never wanted to stay in the same place. And we made three records with Steve Lillywhite, Boy, October, and War, and we finished a cycle of sorts. Under a Blood Red Sky was the full stop at the end of the sentence, and then it was time to begin a new paragraph. Now the members of U2, they were fans of Brian Eno's work and they believed that he was the right person, the right man for the European sounding album that they had in mind. But at the time, Eno was considering retirement from music production altogether. And he wondered if collaborating with U2 would even work. Uh, in an hour-long phone conversation uh, with Bono, Eno admitted that he wasn't a fan of the band. He'd hardly heard any of their records as well. He was legitimately concerned that he would drastically alter the sound that had so far defined their career. As has been the case with many who have fallen deep into conversation with Bono, Brian Eno changed his mind. He changed his mind about retirement and you too. Brian Eno found Bono to be articulate, smart, and sympathetic, and went on to take the job solely on his impression of the band and their ideals. But as an insurance policy, Eno insisted that he bring with him a relatively unknown Canadian producer named Daniel Anwar. The two had worked together before, and Eno believed that Lanois had a knack for getting the best out of musicians. So in May of 1984, U2 started the recording process. The band took up residence at Slane Castle in Ireland, and they began roughing out material for the album. The band and crew and producers all stayed in the castle. The recording took place at all hours, whenever inspiration hit. Bono entered these sessions having composed several songs already, including Pride in the Name of Love. Also, The Unforgettable Fire. Walk on by, walk on and A Sword of Homecoming. Actually, The Unforgettable Fire is my favorite U2 album ever. But in June, after a month of work in the castle, the band and the crew migrated to the studio at Windmill Lane in Dublin to continue work on the album. Their original intent was to record the backing tracks at Slane and then overdub and mix at Windmill. However, after taking a look at what they'd already recorded, U2 was concerned that much of the Slane material was still too bare bones in form. Even contemplating final production was out of the question. 
This meant that U2 ended up putting much more work into their songs at Windmill Lane than they had originally anticipated. They were behind schedule, and so the band worked 20-hour days over the final two weeks at Windmill. And on their last day in the studio, the guys worked through the night to finalize the album by their morning deadline. Recording wrapped up on August 5th, 1984, and the album was released just eight weeks later on October 1st, 1984 in Europe, and then the following day in North America. The title that U2 chose for the album was The Unforgettable Fire. The Unforgettable Fire was a direct reference to an art exhibit about the atomic bombing of Hiroshima, Japan during World War II. Uh, the band had visited the exhibit at the Chicago Peace Museum in 1983 while on their war tour. And the exhibition featured paintings by survivors of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. As Bono contemplated this very dark moment in American and Japanese history, he was profoundly affected. The images and writings stained him, and he couldn't get rid of the thoughts. The more Bono pondered on it, the more that he realized that this image of fire was applicable not only to nuclear warfare, but that it could have a broader, more symbolic interpretation as well. The image of fire consequently came to represent a number of issues on the album, including one inspired by another exhibit that the band visited at the Peace Museum, the life and the work of civil rights leader Martin Luther King. Dr. King had been on Bono's mind since U2's previous album, War, Bono had read Stephen Biot's book, Let the Trumpet Sound, A Life of Martin Luther King Jr., and he was quite inspired by the civil rights leader's life and message. Bono soon began to draw parallels between the civil rights movement in 1960s America and the troubles of Ireland, known internationally as the Northern Ireland Conflict. Bono lamented the, the great distance between how each struggle was handled and despaired for the lack of King's vision in his own native lands. Bono saw the fire that had burned in Dr. King and wanted to capture something of it in a musical tribute to honor his legacy and inspire future generations. The result would be The Unforgettable Fire's third single, Pride in the Name of Love. With the passage of nearly three decades, Pride has become one of the greatest musical tributes to Martin Luther King Jr. ever composed. With the sweeping dynamics, powerful, progressive guitar background, and a soaring refrain, Pride masterfully evokes the feel of Dr. King's peaceful activism and inspires us all to take his message to heart. One man to overthrow. It's a fitting tribute not only to Dr. King, but to the many martyrs who have died throughout history preaching the dignity and the sanctity of every human soul. For those who were close to Bono at that time, it was clear that Pride was an extension of how he saw the world, said co-producer Lanois. Obviously, being Irish young men, they were aware of the troubles of Ireland. They'd written about that in Sunday Bloody Sunday and New Year's Day. Terrible things had happened in Ireland, and Pride was a continuation of Bono's interest in justice and equality. He wanted to talk about that as if to say Martin Luther King Jr. was quite willing to sacrifice his life for what he believed in. As mentioned earlier, Pride was one of a few songs on the Unforgettable Fire to predate the Slain Castle sessions. The chords and melody were actually conceived while on tour in 1983 for their album War at a sound check in Hawaii. Now, the engineers recorded all U2 sound checks for that very purpose. However, when it came to record Pride at Slane Castle and later at Windmill, it proved difficult. The original structure was incredibly complex. Both U2 and producers Eno and Lanois experimented with many less than stellar cuts before deciding to scrap it all together and then just take a break. It took us a while to get that track, Lanois said. We tried it in a castle, we tried it in a rehearsal room, and in the end we got it at a studio called Windmill Lane in Dublin. 
Edge and Bono both agreed that it was Eno's influence that made the difference. Through his direction, they stripped pride down to the barest essentials and started up again. Engineer and mixer Kevin Killen uh, was also present at the numerous recording sessions that were required to bring Pride in the Name of Love together. He remembers one of the primary problems with the song uh, at the time of recording was simply that Bono hadn't finished writing the lyrics. This simple issue led to a continual examination of the arrangement to see if something was preventing Bono from finalizing his words, his lyrics. The clock was ticking, summer was waning, but when Bono finally found what he was looking for, it was immediately apparent to everyone at Windmill Lane. Said Kevin Killen, the first time he sang the finished lyrics, everyone in the control room looked at each other and said, that was definitely it. It was so obvious that he felt comfortable seeing that lyric. The poetic final lines had finally arrived. Early morning, April 4, shot rings out in the Memphis sky. Shot rings out in the Memphis sky. Free at last, they took your life. They could not take your pride. They could not take your pride. He sang it in one take, Killen said. I remember punching it on the tape machine. Every hair on my body stood up. It was such a spine tingling moment. He said something so concisely, so perfectly about Dr. King's life. <laughs> Going back to those lyrics for a moment, all you students of history out there probably already know this, but uh, that reference to early morning on April 4th is factually inaccurate. Dr. King was actually shot in early evening at uh, 601 Central Standard Time. Bono himself has since acknowledged this and has adjusted the lyrics and live performances for greater accuracy. 50 years ago, April 4. But it is the emotional intensity that is invoked by this tragic moment that leaves a lasting impact on all of us. In an instant, uh, we're transported to that tragic day and we're left mourning and desolate. But at the same time, that we're reeling, something stirs within us, a desire to, to carry on his work in our own lives and ultimately leave this world a better place than when we arrived. <laughs> Pride in the Name of Love, although you know the song is dedicated to Martin Luther King Jr., in a few passages, Bono is certainly alluding to Jesus Christ, especially the first few lines. One man come in the name of love, one man come and go. Then again, in the second verse, when Bono sings, one man caught on a barbed wire fence, one man he resists. One man washed upon an empty beach, one man betrayed with a kiss. One man betrayed with a kiss. Of course, referencing when Jesus Christ was betrayed by Judas Iscariot. Uh, I think that Bono was making a connection between Martin Luther King Jr. and Jesus Christ. He seems to be speaking about those throughout history who were killed, martyred, because they passionately preached equality of all men and were an example of nonviolence as the only way of achieving that mission. Uh, they set an indelible example of bringing about change and offering peace and equality universally through spreading light and love. Martin Luther King Jr. is a modern day example of nonviolent resistance as the only way to bring about changes in civil rights, whereas you can make the connection to Christ Jesus of the old world. Pride in the name of love, it's about these examples of peace uh, who live their life with pride. Not, not the boastful kind of pride, mind you, but the pride that an individual has when their thoughts and their actions are motivated by a deeper understanding and a full realization of the sanctity and the dignity of all human life. Oh, the, of life. the basic theme of martyrs, peace, and love, along with references to Dr. King and the aforementioned Jesus Christ, present pride as a universal concept of awareness, of empathy, consciousness, and respect for humanity. The free at last, they took your life, they could not take your pride line. 
That's a reference to King's legendary 1963, I Have a Dream speech. Not their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. But the phrase is actually older, dating back to an old spiritual song. In fact, in Martin Luther King's famous I Have a Dream speech, he references the Bible four times to support his vision. There were verses from Amos, Psalms, Galatians, and perhaps most notably in Isaiah 40, uh, four through five, that says, every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain. And every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain. Dr. King recited this in his speech as, I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted and every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made straight and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. understood that his dream of racial equality was in harmony with God's dream and that the dream would someday be realized. This is a faith that I go back to the South with. That dark moment when Martin Luther King Jr. was killed was such a heart-wrenching tragedy. And yet, instead of extinguishing the fire of Dr. King's movement, his foes only added more fuel to it, creating an unquenchable flame of bright burning hope. For generations, countless individuals across the world have been inspired by the way that Dr. King went about his righteous cause. And this song was a worthy soundtrack to its meaning, beautifully defining Dr. King's crusade and song. Especially when Bono sings that last line, free at last, they took your life, but they could not take your pride. Your life. Now, three music videos were made for Pride. The first was shot by director Donald Kamel, and it features opening and closing shots of the Dublin Docklands area. Two versions of this video exist. There's black and white and sepia. The band, however, wasn't thrilled with Kamel's take, so they agreed to let their principal photographer, Anton Corbin, try his hand at another version. Now, this second attempt was filmed in a basement near London's Heathrow Airport. It features a U2 standing sternly in front of a wall under poor lighting conditions. And unfortunately, U2 was likewise unimpressed with this video. So a third video was ultimately produced by compiling footage shot during the Unforgettable Fire recording sessions at Slane Castle. One man come here to justify the original Kamel video was primarily used in promotion though. Also worth noting is that The Unforgettable Fire features another song about Martin Luther King Jr. simply called MLK. Let it be. You could call it really a companion piece to pride in the name of love. MLK is in essence a benediction to the album, closing it out with a positive vision once again focusing on the power of individuals to overcome adversity and make positive changes in the world around them. Sleep. In this song, Bono offers the peaceful blessing, sleep, sleep tonight, and may your dreams be realized. Be realized. The song is a simple reminder that Dr. King's dreams live on through each of us. Rain on here. Now, Pride in the Name of Love was the third single from The Unforgettable Fire. Like I said, it was released in September of 84. It charted at number two on the US Top Rock Tracks chart, and it went to number 33 on the US Hot 100. It became the biggest hit for U2 up to that point. It really was their breakthrough. Internationally, it broke the top 10 in Poland, in Norway, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Australia. It went to number three in the UK, and it went to number two in U2's home country, Ireland. Also made it into number one in New Zealand. Pride in the Name of Love has been featured in a few different shows over the years. It was in Miami Vice in 1985, A Year in the Life in 1987. It was in The Simpsons in 1998. Elizabeth Town in 2005, The Man in the High Castle in 2015, and Morning Joe in 2021. One man to in the name of love. 
It's also been covered by many artists, the CNC Music Factory from 92. The Royal Philharmonic Orchestra did it in 99. Garbage in 2003. John Legend in 2008. Michael Bolton did it in 2011. David Archuleta did it in 2012. Pride in the Name of Love is a definitive song of our lifetime. You know, with Bono's emotional and truly passionate interpretation, one of his best vocals ever, and that's really saying something. Really captured the peaceful resistance of Dr. Martin Luther King with the edges, the earth-shaking riff that from first listen is permanently scarred upon our souls. I swear it puts a, a lump in my throat every single time that I hear it. And man, talk about Larry Mullen Jr. with his monstrous drum fills that just get your heart pumping. And Adam Clayton's bass line is perfect for this pride-filled anthem. It's a perfect song, and it leaves us with the high ideal to live up to, an example to follow, and an incomparable legacy to honor. Leave us a comment about you 2 and Pride in the Name of Love. What are your memories of this amazing song? Let us know in the comments below. If you dig our content, make sure to subscribe below so that you never miss out on our videos. We'd love to have you as part of our growing community. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.